Hi, I'm Ruby Wax, writer, performer, comedian, and mental health campaigner, and I'm just about coping. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Let me say it again. I'm Simon Blake, and this is Just About Coping. If you haven't listened to the trailer, I'd recommend it to give you a flavour of what I'm hoping to do in this podcast. So who better to start with than the poster girl for mental health? Comedian turned mindfulness guru, Ruby Wax. I was lucky enough to be invited to Ruby's beautiful home in West London, where we talked about her career, the relationship between the mind and the body, our relationship with social media and technology, and the benefits of mindfulness, in which she has a master's degree from Oxford. So, be advised, our chat did include a few swear words and some discussion of difficult themes such as suicide. This is what happened when I spoke to Ruby. Could you tell us, tell us a bit about Ruby Wax, the, the mental health campaign, and where, where did that begin? That began, I think, 15 years ago, where, uh, and I've said this in my show, so if you've seen the show, I'm sorry about this, but it's true, is that Comic Relief said, could I pose for them because they were raising money for mental health. Mm. And so I did, but they put up a giant poster of me in all the tube stations. And it said on it, one in four people have mental illness. One in five people have both. Oh, sorry, let me say it again. One in four people have mental illness. One in f five people have dandruff. I have both. And they put it up without asking me. And so people... I didn't want anybody to know I had a mental illness, so I said that was my publicity poster for a show I was planning on doing. Um, so I saw the posters, and I was kind of mortified because they didn't ask. Mm. But it worked out okay because I have become poster girl for mental illness. It's a whole new career. I always say if you've got an illness, use it. So um, I did a show and pretended that was my publicity poster. And the first show was called Losing It, and I performed it in mental institutions for two years, different ones, yeah. lots of different ones, and they liked it. I make a lot of jokes about it, saying the bipolars would say I laughed, I cried, but it really was my best time because the deal was, of course, I wasn't paid, but I could sleep over because I love mental institutions. Yeah. It's my happy place. Yeah. So um, that was the deal, and then I took it to real theaters, and inadvertently I became a mental health campaigner because in the second half of the show, which was about uh, depression but funny, and now everybody does uh, mental illness, so I feel like my copyright's gone. That's why my new show is not about mental illness, but about the human condition. Um, and what happened in the second half, the audience would stand up and start to speak, but then it they started off just a small number, and now when the theaters got bigger, up to a thousand, you couldn't shut anybody up because people just want to be heard. And then I opened my theater when it was in London and had a walk-in, uh, not when I was performing in the day where I, we invited people just to come in off the street and I'd bring in like the big heavyweights like Lewis Walport or Mark Williams or Peter Fonicky. They'd do a speech. Then Marjorie Wallace would bring in volunteers from SANE. Sure. And now people in the public could talk to a professional. And this was mind-boggling because they'd never spoken before and realized that they could get help and also realized there's no stigma because all of us had something. And then I said, someday I'm going to open cafes that'll be free where people can come and talk this openly. Not about their depression, but just about being human because let's not kid ourselves. It's not just one in four. Everybody's tearing their hair out. And so that was the birth of Frazzle Cafes. And then the Queen gave me an OBE for it. Congratulations. Thanks. On and you too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so I think, you yeah, know, really powerful. And clearly you talk about you know, everybody um, is now talking about it. You know, your, your copyright has, has, has gone. Clearly there's been huge amounts of progress, but the stigma still exists. You, you know, in, your, in your experience, um, you know, can you reflect a bit about why you think that may be? You know, why is that stigma so deep that we, you know, we well, may be making progress? When I was a little, or before I was, when I was very little, it was the gay move, gay movement that suddenly changed within 20 years. Mm. I mean, it became the most popular <laughs> parade in town. And in such a short time, look what happened. So all these taboos are breaking down. But the last stigma is mental health, which is, if you think about it, it's who we are. I mean, I used to say 
that if any other organ goes down, you get sympathy cards and flowers, except mm-hmm. your brain. Yeah. Then everybody walks away. But you, uh, it's sort of better the devil you know. You know, I think people are so afraid of that that might happen to them as if it's catching. Yeah. So they want to move away from it. And unfortunately now it's moving in closer. Yeah. So if it isn't you, it's your parents or your cousin or your friend. And I think there's no denying it now. Even the government have to admit that the reason they're losing money and work, people are committing suicide, is not because they have a broken kneecap. Yeah. So it's the stigma is breaking down. I mean, maybe not up in... Well, I, tr- I tour my show everywhere. There's no place where people don't speak. Sure. And they really want to. So I think the, the, it's, we're past the crest of the wave. Yeah. And when people are speaking, are there sort of themes which come up time and again? Any particular sort of poignant uh, uh, thoughts which people have, you know, expressions of themselves which people are making? Well, they just want to be heard. You know, sometimes yeah. it'll be hilarious. Yeah. And sometimes it'll be, my dad killed himself and I wish I knew things. Not that the show is depressing yeah. but people sometimes just want to say I'm bipolar and this is what's happening and what kind of medication are you on again it's not all about mental illness mm. or my daughter won't come out of a room what do you think or it's a young person saying my man I'm just burning here with mm. these exams I I don't know how to make friends I don't know how to talk it's all ages and they're um they're feeling the pressure of this culture the culture is the disease not mm. us and I think that's the really powerful sort of it isn't it that actually what you said before is um it's about being human you know mental health is about who we are and and what we are i don't understand and uh, the mind mental is physical yeah i mean there is nobody up there who's imagining things and bubbles you know thought bubbles this whole thing is a onesie yeah and if your brain goes down you can kiss goodbye to your immune system and most diseases are because something happened in the brain the brain sends them is the messenger you know, it sends the messages. I, and if people understood more, you know, but instead they do star signs. Um, not that I, I'm in Aries, but, you know, you, I don't want to be not popular. <laughs> I don't want to be not popular, but um, but you see people, I don't know, it's, tw- it's, you know, we're in the 21st century and people are don't even know what to eat. You know, one week you have to eat chickens and the next week turf. I don't, you know, we don't know anything. But what we should know a little bit about, and kids know, that the brain is running us. Yeah. We aren't running it. So learn how it works a little bit. You know, not Don't become a neurosurgeon. And then you won't punish yourself so much for when you feel it's anger rising or negative thoughts. It's all part of the equipment yeah. and why we have it. You know, there's a reason we have negative thinking. Yeah. And, uh, and it is the human condition. Yeah. It's not your condition. Yeah. And I think that's something from reading um, your books that really um, struck me, really, is how much um, underst- I've learned about and understanding the brain and, and what, that, what that does. So I guess my question would be, do you think we would do things differently, take better care of ourselves if we understood the brain a bit more? I don't, you know, humans are partially, and that's my show in my book, partially savage. You know, there's a reptilian brain and then there's an evolved brain. It's more complicated, but... A lot of, you know, part of us is very savage. Mm. Now, we were born to be, I was talking about it this morning, we have to have this unease, otherwise we'd never accomplish anything, sure. or a nagging thing saying, this doesn't feel good, maybe I should make a telephone, you know, because I'm sick of the parchment, and then when the telephone afterwards, we should make an iPhone. It's all the unease that makes us progress. Yeah, yeah. And the addiction to more and more, uh, to easier and faster. So look what we've built. But on the other hand, um, we have an evolved brain that has to kick in at some point. But then we do have this evolved brain, but you have to exercise it. It's there, but we just don't use it, which gives you self-control, rational thinking, uh, compassion, awareness, um, you know, just just a more feeling side of the brain and more, um, I can feel what you feel. That isn't in the reptilian. That's fight and flight. So the other kind of a brain, we have to kick in intentionally. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're just competing like a, like a wild animal. And we are in a culture where nobody, the good guys don't win. Yeah. Um, and, and you... Oh, so your question was, do you think if we knew more, 
okay, well, you'd, you'd forgive yourself more to understand why there's rage and anger and envy and shame because those came for a reason with the package. We had to be um, in the tribe. We had to feel we weren't pulling our weight, and that was kind of shaming. And then we try harder. It was healthy. But now when you're competing on social media with you know somebody who jogs 48 hours like you <laughs> and then you know has a job where he makes 200,000 a year and has the perfect wife we can't keep up and so it burns us alive you know if you, you just knew about the neighborhood you'd be okay yeah um, and you talked uh, before about compassion obviously compassion for ourselves is one of the things which perhaps is so much more important in a world where we can see mm. so many things around us with social media and um I, I guess it'd be really interesting actually to just touch on um, social media uh, a little bit and uh, yeah, thoughts, pros and cons of it. What's, what is, you know, you know I'm a little, um, when people speak about social media, they get uh, in, incensed <laughs> or angry or fearful. And I just think these are buttons that we push, just like talking about Brexit or the one in America, it's we become suddenly we 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 become obsessed with what can we do, and it, it's even more fearful. Mm. So, but social technology isn't going away, yeah. so you better lie back and take it. So this is where I'm saying we have to exercise some muscle in our brain to be able to navigate it, because it's coming and it's going to be in you and around you, and it's going to be temp tempting. Yeah. You know, who wouldn't want to just think about the food and it shows up in your mouth? Uh, unless you want to go off grid, but most people just fall into it, and there must be something in your mind, only if you want, that says, okay, I'm really going to use this now for all it's worth, and now I'm going to shut down and go quiet and into myself and back to the human, mm -hmm. and then go out and be partially machine, but that takes a lot of work. You know, that's not easy. It's like saying, oh, give up smoking. Yeah. And it's it's really interesting, isn't it? Because social media, as you said, often becomes demonized as the problem. And actually... Yeah, it's it, us. It's us. We, we <laughs> did it. It didn't land like a, a meteorite. It's us. Yeah. And we, we made it. So stop pointing the finger. Yeah. I think people have to understand the reason this is going on is maybe not because of you, high and mighty, but it's us as a human race. Yeah. So, uh, But I, I think I'm not a politician, but... Fix yourself and then go save the world. That's my kind of thing. Yeah. Don't blab on about it. Either get off the pot and go work in a refugee camp mm -hmm. or shut up at a dinner party. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I was on a um, uh, holiday a couple of weeks ago in Greece and I was reading Frazzled uh, on right. the beach. Uh, and the person uh, next to me was from Middlesbrough and had also um, read Frazzled. And the conversation that we had was... Uh, that the key lesson from this was nobody's going to do it for you. You're going to have to work hard in order to get your brain to work, to enable yourself to think and behave in the ways that you want to. And I thought it was uh, really interesting at the point at which they said, um, and sometimes it feels too hard and easier to just go with how things, how things are, but they were working hard in order to try and work hard on themselves. And, and that was the sort of the key message that they were taking from the book. No one's going to do this for you. You're going to have but to But everything yourself. you learn, you know, from math to walking to talking, you had to practice. It, it, so people say, give me a top tip or what's a pill, you know, I can take. Well, if it was that easy, I'd be doing it. Sure. Um, the, the, you can do it if you want. If you don't, you know, if I want a six pack, there, I can wish it all I want. Yeah. But you, like you know, have to get in that swimming pool four times a week. Yeah. Or, you know, do your running. Uh, so the same with the mind. There are exercises. It doesn't have to be mindfulness. Tai Chi is really good. Things that whenever you focus on, on the body or yeah. physical, yeah. the brain cools down. You can't be yabbering up here if you pull focus to, let's say, and I don't mean being in the gym and reading a book and filing your nails and watching TV. <laughs> I mean when you really focus in on the body like an athlete does. Yeah. The chattering comes down. Yeah. But th that's not the idea. The idea is now when you're in front of somebody who's terrifying you or somebody's pushing your button, you remember how to pull, pull the focus down yeah. so that you're not pumped full of that red mist and yeah. lose your mind. Yeah. I mean, but it's your choice. Yeah. You know, and I, I think now there are tools like CBT, cognitive based uh, therapy, yeah. and 
mindfulness is if you want to cut out the therapist. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to save money and, <laughs> you know, you just do it a minute a day. It does exercise the brain and you can see the six pack in an MRI scanner. Yeah. It's not a six pack, but I wouldn't be doing it if you didn't see physical evidence. No, absolutely. So um, you obviously have a master's degree in mindfulness based cognitive therapy. therapy. Yeah, you uh, got so, that. So uh, a good segue in. So if you were to describe the purpose of mindfulness in, in one sentence, well, for those you who don't. You're doing exactly what people do. Would you explain jobs? Jogging in one sentence. No, but I might try, I guess. Go ahead, try. Mm. Uh, I can't, actually, off, yeah. off the cuff. There is no one sentence. Yeah. Frazzled is a whole book, you can buy it, where it explains it, and it explains it from the horse's mouth, which is my professor, who is Mark Williams, mm -hmm. who invented it. Um, it's mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. He invented it, so he allows me to translate it into comedy. Yeah that you can go shopping while you're doing it. You can, you know, stand in a queue. You could be on the loo, whatever. It, it's a way of exercising your brain. I mean, you can exercise your pelvic floor when you're in a bus queue. <laughs> Believe it or not, you don't have to be in a gym. Sure. You just pull up your pelvic floor. Nobody knows, yeah. except you pull up a lot of leaves on the ground. <laughs> but otherwise, <laughs> nobody knows. So mindfulness is the same thing. You notice where your mind goes, and it's not pretty. You know, the shit show that you get is horrible. But then you start to you pull the focus to something physical. It could be a breath, breathing, and then the mind takes it, and then you bring it back, and that's the equivalent of lying on your back and sitting up and lying on your back. And each time you do that, you strengthen a part in your brain that helps you pull focus. So you're saying to the mind, in a nice way, get back here. I'm controlling you. I'm controlling you. You're not going, come on, bitch, lie down. Yeah. Because we are all uh, programmed to be cruel mostly to ourselves, but you just, you go, okay, everybody thinks like this. Everybody's got, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm an idiot. I'm not getting away. Everybody has it. Nobody doesn't have it unless you're in a coma. So you see where the mind goes, it hasn't done anything wrong. Pull it to, you could do it to your feet hitting the floor when you're jogging. Yeah. Breath is easy because it keeps coming. Or it could be your taste in coffee. Watch where the mind goes, bring it back to the taste. Anytime you bring your focus to a sense, you're um, lassoing in that brain, and then it becomes your new habit. It's your new default. So when my mind, like now, is all over the place, it's easier for me to focus on you. Otherwise, I, my hand would be on that telephone. But don't think it doesn't want to go yeah. to the iPhone. Yeah, it wants to. But I've, you know, I've trained that bitch up there to say, "Listen to this guy. You're here now. It's not going to help to go to the phone." Yeah. But every part of my body wants to go to the phone because yeah. I have really important, you know, the White House is calling. Uh, Putin wants to know what to do next. And mm. so I really need to be on that phone. Mm. That's what's going on in my head. Yeah. Uh, Meanwhile, I'm getting spam thinking it's really important. <laughs> it's interesting, is it? So I also, yeah, my phone. Uh, left what are you thinking of now? I'm thinking of, uh, I'm, I'm listening. Well, and, you're and, reading. Uh, well, uh, I was listening and thinking about uh, having read Frazzled on holiday in Greece. We actually spent uh, uh, an evening um, drinking uh, pretty awful wine and, uh, and a delicious Greek salad and properly tasting, observing. I was with my, uh, my partner. And it is actually something quite incredible to just focus on what you're doing and really yeah. think about it and sometimes it's delicious and sometimes it's awful and sometimes your mind takes you and you're back in london yeah and sometimes you're in the future it doesn't matter yeah you can't control your brain completely it takes you and that's the, that's the bit that you should clap and congratulate yourself on is that you noticed it went away yeah. that's the reward not the bringing it back you go i've noticed my mind has wandered yeah that's as far as you can take it yeah but you bring it back to the physical sense because otherwise it'll take you. And then you'll be in Spain and then you'll be in Europe and eventually you'll get to the iPhone, call a travel agent and book another <laughs> holiday, which I've done while you're on holiday. <laughs> I've done that one. It's the best feeling, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, it and you're helps insane. to get the blues. Yeah, but then eventually there's a moment where you've flipped. Yeah. You know, it's really healthy and, and efficient, but there's a moment where you're out of your mind. <laughs> um, so in your show, you talk about um, Descartes saying, I think, therefore, um, I am. Can you just yeah. tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it's in How to Be Human, the show. He did say it, but I then say it, he got it wrong because um, I know better. But I, 
I clearly don't. But the thing is, everybody who studied him knows he's wrong. We aren't our thoughts. And then I say, thank God, otherwise I'd be a shopping list. Um, but the thing is, we're, we are not our, just our thoughts. And then I have to explain that your thoughts are 1% of the 99% that's running you. So you don't know when you're swallowing and what happens to that food on its way down. You don't know when your heart is beating or you're about to get, you know, uh, you know, have a, a fit. You just don't know. All you're thinking about is your shopping list, really. You're sure. thinking, I got to do this. I have to do this based on these bodily sensations. So I, later in the show, I said, I can't really tell the difference when I'm in love and when I have indigestion. They feel the same. So your thoughts are always interpreting this gigantic kind of huge uh, cosmos living under your neck so thoughts are kind of tiny and that's I guess another thing to get your head around is they may be wrong they aren't you who you are they may be wrong I might talk to my husband tonight about whether I've had indigestion for the last 15 years yeah. or whether it's love <laughs> <laughs> Ask him. think about it you know you want to throw up in the beginning yeah we we talked a bit about um how much things are changing, how much m mental health is now being talked about. If you were to say where you think we need to um, focus our energies, if we're really going to shift the culture about mental health so that people can um, talk freely, understand their bodies, do you have any thoughts about where we need to go next, uh, you know, building on the momentum that already exists? Well, the money now that you give to various charities. It was never really given to the brain, not as much. And I was at a, a meeting where there were people from Oxford, the kind of professors saying, you know, we Oxford was the one that cured TB, I think, and they also came up with uh, a cure for polio. This year, and for the following years, we're gonna cure mental illness. So you, it's a trend. Now, when they start to understand where depression is, but it's very difficult, what schizophrenia actually looks like then if you're fired from your work you hold up a little sign that says this is my disability and if they dare fire you you take them to court just like you would if you were physically disabled so the more money goes into understanding the brain the quicker we'll be able to say this is an actual disease this isn't because somebody thought should I go to a golf club or should I try to commit suicide sure um and so I think that's a way to break for me I'm very I like science Figure it out, and then people won't think you're a wanker when you can't get out of bed. Sure. So comedy clearly has an important role in breaking down some of the taboos and some of the traditions. That's what comedy has yeah. done around all sorts of, of issues. Um, in terms of your experience of, of talking about mental health in, in comedy shows, you know, what, what would your reflections be on its contribution to breaking down some of the stigma in, 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 your, in your experience? You know, a comedian is supposed to be the philosopher of their age, yeah. and it stopped being that because we went to a phase of aren't men uh, awful and look how fat I am. There, there's been a trend, or you know, we just pounding whoever politician happens to come in. But the the genius of all times is George Carlin, and if you want to get an overview of politics or anything, the way we live, go to him. Sure. Don't, don't read Heidegger. So um, that's your job. And a comedian is there to hold up a mirror. And if the audience laugh, it means they recognize it. And once we're all on the same planet, mm -hmm. then you can do stuff. If they laugh, it means there's mutual understanding. If people are angry, they're in their own world. So uh, a real, the real job of comedy is to get a commonality going in the room. And then we're all human. Sure. What I would be, uh, so we're sort of moving towards uh, the end of our time together. So just thinking about the, the future, um, you know, if you could paint uh, you know, the, the sort of perfect picture, the, the world view that we're striving for, you know, what, what, what would that look like in That's Ruby's my world? next book. <laughs> Is it? It's called <laughs> The Future with Love. Okay. Um, so, but I can't, you know, I can't, I can only, I'm trying to say what's happening now that makes the future look really hopeful rather than another doomsday scenario sure i don't know i have wh why would i know if if somebody could read the future we'd be you know everybody's these futurologists writing books what do they know 
Uh, we, we can't say. Half the people will become more savage, and then maybe a few will, a few souls, you know, that are trying to self-evolve or, you know, at least be able to deal with it. Will There will always be those people. Mm-hmm. But um, if they don't kick in, then we'll all get swept up. And, and clearly, I guess, we, we, we don't you know. You know, what's to say Trump doesn't push the button or, you know, North Korea doesn't go... No- but I don't want to live in fear, you know. Otherwise, it's not happening right this second. And I think that's my exact point, actually, is let's not live in fear, but what, let's, let's live in, in, in hope and, and, and that sort of sense. And we know that hope is so important in terms of recovery, in terms of Yeah, in terms of, of people like you or, you know, making that volunteer sector, you know, a parody there between, you know, that we should really honor those people that are doing the real thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the 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 sort of sense, you know, that you know the work that you've done with the Frazzled Cafe and giving people a space, you know, the yeah. the work that we're doing at MHFA England is all part of a bigger picture, isn't it? Which is about trying to enable all of us to manage ourselves, to learn to yeah. understand ourselves a bit better, and to and to help. You know, that's the Frazzled Cafe thing. Is that there's a group of people. They're not in there moaning. They're there to help each other. And not for mental illness reasons, but because they're human and everything is, is harder these days, even though it's not tangible. So, you know, there's a safe, there's safety, there's anchors by the Frazzle Cafe is, and then first aid, train the facilitators so that that space is safe and it's held. And these people meet every two weeks so that this becomes their new tribe because we don't have community. Yeah. Or some of, a lot of us don't. And so it's an artificial community, but it's their lifeline. And I think there should be more of those yeah. because we have to do an antidote to, um, to just, you know, using a screen. Again, we, God bless it. I, I love those screens, but we do have to be near each other so we can pass, pass the love, you know, look yeah. in each other's eyes. And if you can't at work and you can't with your family, then you go to Frazzle Cafe. And so I think that point, you know, takes us right back to the beginning, doesn't it, around um, how we cope, how we really live is about um, understanding ourselves, um, having that compassion for other people and the, the hope of a world in which we are, yeah. feel able to love ourselves and to, yeah, to love each other. Yeah, but the only point of loving yourself or being kind to yourself is that it spreads to the next guy. This isn't like to s- let's all sit in a tub and eat a flake bar, you know, and, <laughs> s- and put some yak oil on. Uh, the point of being tolerant with your own madness and, and darkness is that it, your, your essence, it's neural Wi-Fi, we pass our state to the next guy. If the thoughts aren't overwhelming you, you know, you're not in the midst of this brainstorm, if you can just get the, get the thoughts a little bit, you know, quieter, then I'm more available to hear what you're saying. If I'm, you know, in the storm of my mental, you know, uh, weather conditions I can't hear what you're talking about or can I give you any empathy because I'm too busy in my own self-absorbed cocoon but the idea is if you can cool it down not make your thoughts go away you just have a different relationship you go yeah yeah I'll get to you later and I can focus on you I've passed I've actually passed a hormone you know called oxytocin which makes your heartbeat come down and your um you know, you're, you're breathing more even. That's how mothers grow their babies' brains, and that's how we relate to each other as adults. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I mean, Ruby, thank you so much thank for you. talking um, to me. Thanks. It's been an honor and privilege. Thank you for oh. welcoming us into the house. This is the first ever Just About Coping um, podcast, and I know that people will enjoy listening to you as much as I have. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. I don't think I could have asked for a better start to my very first podcast, The Inimitable Ruby Wax There, talking about our mind and body as a onesie. Ruby's latest book, How to Be Human, The Manual, is available now. She's on tour until the end of November 2019 with The Monk and The Neuroscientist from the same book. For all the dates, head to Ruby's website, which will be in the description. If you want to find out more about the Frazzled Cafe meetings Ruby talked about, head to frazzledcafe.org. We're working with Frazzle Cafe to train their facilitators in Mental Health First Aid England training, which I'm very excited about. 
So if you'd like to hear more of our podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. Please also rate us on the same place so we can find out what you think and make sure to spread the word using social media with the hashtag JAC podcast. I hope you enjoyed this first episode and until next time, I've been Simon Blake and thanks for coping with us.